Welcome everyone and thank you for joining another virtual presentation as a part of our 2021 Global Health Leaders Conference at Johns Hopkins University program. Uh, today we are very happy to have Mr. Brig Riley at our conference representing Doctors Without Borders, uh, internationally known as their French name Médecins Sans Frontières or MSF. Uh, to briefly introduce Mr. Riley and MSF, he has been working in American Indian and Alaskan Native Health since 2006. Uh, prior to Indian Health Service, he worked for MSF for 10 years in several emergency and non-emergency project settings and serving on the MSF Board of Directors. Uh, he obtained a master's in public health from Tulane University and a BA in philosophy from the College of William and Mary. Uh, MSF is an international independent medical humanitarian organization, which is also recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, they provide medical assistance to people affected by conflict, epidemics, disasters or exclusion from healthcare. Uh, their teams are made up of tens of thousands of health professionals, logistics and administrative staff, and their actions are guided by medical ethics and the principles of impartiality, independence and neutrality. Hi there, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so before I start slides, yeah, I think you heard from the introduction, my background, I worked in uh, many different settings. Uh, I first went out as an epidemiologist and an Epidemiology in some of these settings is actually really basic, right? It's a clipboard, it's a tally sheet, how many people got sick that were under five, how many people got sick that were older, um, how many died. So it's a, it's a far cry from some of the, the more sophisticated epidemiology you might be doing in, in other spots, but um, it still provides really important um, uh, in data on trends and where we're going, what kind of resources we're gonna need, and also témoignage, which is a term that I'll explain um, later in the presentation. I'm gonna to try to talk for about 40, 45 minutes max. I hope to challenge some of your Atlas skills. We're gonna um, have pictures only and um, bring in from a, a lot of different projects. And then I will leave, try to leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So as you know, we go by MSF. Um, this is a picture from, uh, uh, this is from Jordan, um, a doctor's playing chess with one of the patients. Uh, Syria has been one of our largest programs for uh, a long time. MSF treats patients that are wounded there and also in the surrounding countries. So um, it's basically, as, uh, as was already in the introduction, we have about 43,000 people who are working in our projects at any given time in about 70 countries. So I'll go over the emergencies that we respond to, how we go about responding, and who actually does this work. And then I'll talk about one project that I was on, um, just to give some, um, I think, concrete examples. It's, it's always interesting to hear um, concrete stories. Of, of difficulties and dilemmas that you can imagine would come up at some of these settings. So neutrality is one of our main principles. This means uh, basically not taking sides in a conflict or a political crisis. So most of the places we work, about half at least, um, we're providing care to people caught in a fleeing conflict or internal stability situation um, and uh, things are very insecure. By staying neutral, we're, we're not endorsing one side or the other but we plan our projects um, based first and foremost on the medical needs in the ground. Um, establishing neutrality is, is easier uh, said than done. Um, I think there's a natural suspicion when outsiders come in to a situation like this and start setting up programs. Um, there's a natural concern about Western bias because it's seen as a very Western organization. Um, and in fact, at, although most of our programs are, are done by staff hired locally, um, again, it's still, I think, seen as a Western organization. So what I mean is we need to really prove by providing quality medical care that we are what we, what we say we are. And in this way, generally both sides have a nephew or a mother or someone who has gotten care at one of our programs. And they know that, they, that we are um, what, what we say we are, nothing more and nothing less. Oh, and this one, I'll try to name every country in this. This one is Yemen. Oh, it's labeled. Some of them are not labeled. Okay, Central African Republic. So impartiality is another core principle. And so this means we'll treat anybody who needs care, no matter who they are. This has a, you know, this has a base in medical ethics. We're gonna see everybody in need as equally deserving of treatment. In rare situations, I'd say in about 12 programs that I was in, this happened in one or two of them, we will sometimes um, treat combatants. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a very rare situation. It, um, it's rare that they would come to an MSF uh, facility. But international law dictates clearly that a, wooden com a wounded combatant is, is out of the war, at least for a time, and should be granted medical care, regardless of how or why they were wounded, as long as they leave their guns um, outside the facility. 
This is a vaccination program in a church. The children are first registered at the door and then being conducted to the medical team. So we've got to get our documentation right and get everything ready for maximum efficiency. And I'd say this is pretty typical that we are using an existing community structure um, instead of a tent. This, where possible, this is, this is obviously preferable. Independence, um, this is, a, this is a, a neat way of delivering supplies in some of the more further reaches of Democratic Republic of Congo. So by independence, you know, these MSF in some ways be, is, and humanitarian in general can represent resources in a very resource poor setting. Um, and in, in these conflicts, it can create pressure from one side to the other to push, uh, push populations out of, of getting these resources or push them into it. So basically there's a lot of uh, political, military and economic um, agendas going on in a lot of these contexts. And that includes pressures on, on aid agencies um, or governments to, they'll push us to maybe do one agenda or the other. And we don't take their money, which makes us independent of them. I think if you take their money, then um, either gently or more harshly, you can be directed to where they want to, to the activities they want to see happen. And so what we do is we mainly rely about 90% on individual donations. And it's, this lets us go to contexts that are really not in the news that, that no one cares about perhaps, um, and also go to where medical care is the greatest rather than um, following a political agenda. This is in no ways to demean any other organization that are taking government money. It's more an insurance policy that we have as far as being able to really do what we want where there's very fraught politics. So activities, um, this is from 2019, they did not give me 2020, but this would be, uh, probably very different in 2020 due to COVID, but I don't have those numbers, but over 10 million outpatient consultations, over a million measles vaccination, and um, over 18,000 people treated for tuberculosis. So you can see a wide range here of, uh, of activities, uh, medical, primary health care, infectious disease, uh, there's, there's a lot that we do. And again, we can talk about any individual topic um, during the Q&A. As far as the range, uh, last count was 72, um, 72 countries around the world. The country I'm going to talk about, we have actually left. The project I'm going to talk about where I was in was in uh, Sri Lanka. That is no longer one of the countries uh, indicated here. What's interesting in, in um, the map for 2020 will actually include the USA. We finally um, did some domestic projects because the need was so great on COVID, mobilizing um, domestic resources here. and and supporting um, certain hotspots. So again, 2019, because 2020 was um, a very atypical year, I would say this would represent um, uh, a more expected uh, distribution of where projects are and how much uh, resources we're, we're putting towards them. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan um, and, and Yemen top it. Back when I was in MSF more active, I said now I'm, I'm living in the US full time and on the board, definitely Afghanistan and uh, Central Asia were higher on this list than, than some of these other countries are now. Iraq used to be much higher and that has come down as has Syria. So we go to different types of emergencies. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways we categorize them and I'll try to give you an idea of what they are and um, how we respond to them. So armed conflict, about half are in armed conflict. And that's a very, this one is, you know, war-torn Syria here, but there's a lot of other places that are really borderline that we don't hear about. Haiti right now has um, really heavy violence to the point that a lot of our, our, um, our workers have very difficult time getting to the hospital safely. Um, so Central African Republic, there's a lot of uh, fighting still. Um, Ethiopia, unfortunately, is, is also um, proving to be a very difficult spot to work in. So there's a lot of conflicts that I think are not making the news, and these are conflict zones that uh, MSF works in, um, in on a routine basis. So again, it's, we do it with humanitarian medical needs, prioritizing where we work, um, and we try to help people who need it the most. And we try to make sure that both parties or sometimes multiple parties in a conflict see us as not being on one side or the other. It's part of our security. We do not travel with armed escorts. 
Now it can be kind of stressful um, and to work in a conflict zone. Uh, one of the main things that you are talking to whoever is in charge of that area. And if they say you cannot go or you will not go um, or somehow imply that we will not be safe, then we're not gonna push it. That's not what we're gonna do. Um, but uh, things get a little trickier when there are no one's in charge, right? And, and then it can really be about going within a certain city from A to B, is this safe? And, and a much more local, um, local power structure. So each field mission has specific and uh, detailed safety regulations in place, outlining strategies and specific security measures and responsibilities. Generally, when I would be in a conflict situation, it would be standard um, sometimes to go with two vehicles. So one could always help the other if something happened mechanically. Um, sometimes the roads were so bad that one might need to winch the other one out if it were, if it were the rainy season. Um, you would want one so that if the radio went out, the other one was there to, uh, to, to help. Um, but it also takes two vehicles out of your pool, uh, sometimes all day. So then that creates just using those two vehicles for security um, limits how many maybe clinics or villages you can get to in a day. Um, so these, these create some hard choices. Another standard security um, part will be a check-in. So um, as, a, as a clinician hit it out there, you will not be driving yourself. We definitely use people that are from the area to drive. They know things better. They can talk to um, authorities better. So they're much more than a driver. I would say they are really our, our guide and our um, really, uh, and I'd say some of the strongest bonds I've made with some of the folks who, who have just the title driver. Um, they do a lot more than that. They are really our, 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 our leads in some ways. And um, you will, what you'll do is you'll radio in on a waypoint. So if I'm going 20 miles, and it doesn't sound like much, but perhaps um, the road is so uh, rutted and difficult um, that it'll take uh, a few hours, um, you'll radio in at certain points, and this will tell the, the dispatch back there that each car is getting to where it's going. Um, and that way, if there's a failed check-in, somebody can go be sent to figure out what happened as soon as possible. Environmental disasters, um, these make the headlines a lot, but they're not as, as big a percentage of our, um, of our interventions. We can go fast to a lot of these places because we're already working there. Um, this one is from Mozambique. And so, um, when we had we had a lot of medical projects there and by being there when the natural disaster hits we will have staff ready in place we'll have we'll know the terrain um all of this saves us many days or even weeks on getting things started which of course can be life or death in some of these situations we also have emergency stores uh so we call it e-prep or emergency preparation stores and i'll get to that when i talk about logistics um, it's a small preventive measure that can really, um, really have a big impact on what you can do, right? Because you can't just show up at a village like this with clipboards, right? You don't know what's going on, but you do, you do know there's going to be needs. So you do need to show up some supplies and some tangible support as soon as it's possible. This one is from um, Cyclone Edai, um, and this was um, a huge, uh, uh, it turned out to be a huge project, a lot of it to work with the Ministry of Health to rehabilitate damaged health facilities. Um, but it also interrupted a lot of uh, existing medical programs. Uh, while you're responding to the emergency, HIV patients still maintain their viral uh, suppression. Uh, you also have tuberculosis patients who need their um, um, appointments and their drugs to stay adherent and not to have uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. And you still have um, women coming in and they need maternal uh, care because they're, they're going to be having children and some of, them, uh, some of those births will have complications. So... We've got to try to keep this all going um, all at once. Exclusion for healthcare. This is another category. Um, this one from Libya. Um, and so this is an example where um, MSF provides medical care um, for migrants from Central Asia and North Africa who have been detained in Greece or Italy from East or West Africa as they move through Libya as a waypoint and across the Mediterranean Sea. Um, these groups can be held in, in limbo, and I think it's, it's, um, it's MSF is really the, the only actor, right? And so this is not sort of a natural disaster or, or armed conflict, but there's really, um, there's really no other actor working to um, help these, uh, these people who have been excluded from all other systems of care. Um, Libya's, Libya does, what can I say? I, I guess for lack of a better term, no one wants them, right? No one's, no one's supporting them. So MSF has uh, set up a lot of programs 
in this uh, envelope. Force displacement. Uh, this is a, a very big part of, of um, what we do. So you're leaving home. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the force from home exhibit, but it's basically a lot of these is, is grab 10 things, get out the door, um, danger is coming and uh, you need to leave. And so this, this journey can be done in a couple ways, right? MSF is really fighting it for it to be done as humanely as possible for as few people to suffer trauma as possible um, and for um, it to be, uh, and, and to provide proper medical care. We do not, there's a certain dignity factor here. This, I think this woman has probably lost about everything. She's in a shelter that she doesn't wanna be in that she's been forced in by the government and will probably be sent home. So while MSF tries to stay out of the politics on actual huge policies, we do talk about what we're seeing and the, the political cost, uh, the human cost of these policy decisions. Um, in terms of, of mental and, and physical health and fight that these, these um, migrants or wherever, wherever, um, wherever we are, this one in, in Central, these are often migrants from Central America. The previous slide was from um, Middle East and Northern Africa, that they're treated with dignity and, um, and respectfully and, and uh, not treated like we're seeing here. Epidemics, um, I would say, this is what I work the most with. And again, this often overlaps with our conflict zones, right? These epidemics tend to uh, flourish in a, in a spot where um, infrastructure has broken down, there's crowded conditions, vaccination schedules are out the window. So these epidemics are, are a big part of what MSF responds to. It's so also public health wise, this is where you get some of the biggest life-saving interventions for, for your resources. So measles, cholera, malaria, TB, HIV and AIDS, and um, Ebola. Some of those have got very different responses. And again, I, I can leave those for Q&A on if, if there's a particular disease of interest um, and I've happened to work on one of those. Um, so this one is from a measles epidemic in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's, um, it's one of the world's biggest uh, recorded in years. And I think we're gonna see this again as vaccination chains got interrupted with, um, with COVID. So um, measles is I think underappreciated as far as how contagious and how deadly it can be, especially for children, um, as far as both uh, deaths and blindness that it can cause. So uh, I think MSF is quite good at emergency vaccination. There were times that we thought maybe we would try to do something here uh, the licensures and the complications, the administrative requirements of actually working, doing COVID vaccinations in, in the U.S. Um, really precludes bringing in an international um, team to, to do that, unfortunately. Um, but in this, in this particular outbreak, um, over uh, about one and a half million children were uh, vaccinated for measles and about 46,000 uh, measles patients had to be treated. Uh, so a uh, huge scale as, as far as um, uh, level of intervention on some of these epidemics. So I keep bringing up COVID-19 and we're right back here in the U.S. As I told you, that country would be um, one, of the, uh, one of the indicated countries that we were operational. So um, it wasn't really something that we'd ever done before, um, but as the need became clear and we have a lot of people who are return volunteers and we have a lot of connections here domestically, uh, so what MSF did, at least um, the, the three main pillars, I would say, supporting the authorities to provide care for COVID-19 patients. So helping them with policies. And, and I know in some places we would triage, right? You've got very complicated um, COVID things. If you're symptomatic, go in that line. If not, go in that line. So we would help some of these local health authorities um, uh, both uh, design and implement them. I think it's not to imply that they couldn't have done it themselves. It's not sort of like we came in and, and, and were know-it-alls. It's more, as you know, these, some of these policies changed so quickly and some of them were so context specific that you really had different levels of what was realistic uh, and feasible uh, based on your situation while trying to be compliant with these bigger guidelines. So MSF really played a role in that, uh, both in uh, quite a few places, Florida, um, uh, some tribal nations in New Mexico and Arizona and um, Puerto Rico. And as you can see, pretty much everywhere we worked, we worked, um, a lot of it was distributing um, personal protective equipment to the extent possible. 
um, when that was the initial bottleneck. Right now, we're working very hard on vaccine access because that is now the next bottleneck that we're, we're seeing. Well, how does MSF respond? Um, I have never been in a boat MSF, but there are some projects with boats. Um, this will be something locally chartered and we'll put an MSF flag for safety and identification. Um, and so this is basically just very basic, getting supplies out to flood victims in Mozambique. Um, there's five kinds of crisis, uh, basically, um, that I mentioned to summarize, conflict, malnutrition, epidemics, natural disasters, and exclusion from healthcare. So I'll spend some time on this next slide because this is really what we do, right? Primary healthcare. So, this is preventing a lot of things, um, preventive care and curative care to prevent something that might be routine um, and, and prevent it from turning into something potentially lethal. I would say, as you saw, malaria is one of the biggest ones. There are a lot of, um, a lot of countries with Plasmodium falciparum, which is, is the, deadliest, uh, the deadliest type of malaria. And we've been working with this for decades. Some years ago, the big battle was actually for um, improving the, the generation of drug. We used to work with a drug called chloroquine, um, which was somewhat effective, but through time and partial dosing and the, and the way that, that um, these diseases evolved, um, chloroquine generally became um, ineffective, but there was not the money to move up to the next generation of artemisinin-based uh, therapies. This created a, a big conflict in a lot of our settings of pushing for um, a new, the new, newest treatment when it, when it wasn't, quote, affordable. Um, but there are a lot of things that go into affordability. Um, and again, we can table that un, until the end because the access to drugs, um, we don't always go all the way up in the chain, but we do find out, well, hang on, why are we not able to treat these patients? Why is the doctor or nurse on the front line not able to deliver the care that's indicated, and that's recommended? What's the barrier there? And that's when we'll sometimes find ourselves drawn into policy and, and activism and witnessing. Upper respiratory infections, right? There's a lot of those. Want to monitor those from becoming uh, uh, lower respiratory infections or pneumonia. A lot of trauma. Um, there's burns, there's stitches. All these things need to be attended to. And especially in tropical countries, these can become infected um, quite easily if they're not, um, if they're not, we don't work with them. Diarrheal disease, um, still, uh, People dying of dehydration is still a big problem. And of course, that has its roots uh, sometimes. And when you're forced to flee and forced to move, um, everybody's using a very um, insecure in terms of, uh, let's say, um, informal water source, which can be infected and spread transmission very quickly. Um, malnutrition is another one. I will actually show you an innovation on malnutrition. It's not two words you usually hear in the same sentence, innovations and malnutrition. Um, but just as I was, I was leaving the field, there's this thing came up called um, ready to use therapeutic foods. And um, I'll have a slide on that. Mobile clinics, well, they can't come to us and there's often good reasons they can't, we will try to get to them. Um, it's not ideal uh, because there's a lot of efficiency um, costs, but if it's what we need to get to our patient, so this one's so cool. I have, I have not been there in person. Uh, I've been to DRC working, but not this, this particular project. As you can see, he's gonna um, unload the motorcycle off the dugout canoe. And then um, I, would, I would assume that that was that earlier photo we saw from DRC of him um, driving the motorcycle with supplies to the sawgrass uh, um, trail there. So these are, you know, this is often for very remote areas or populations on the move. Or sometimes we're, uh, the security is not stable enough for us to actually be there full time, right? We kind of have to day trip in and get back out um, because we just don't have the safety assurances we think we need. Um, you know, often the mobile clinic will be a team treating patients in a school or under a tent or under a tree. And if you think if you want to deliver really quality of care, think what that implies in a situation like this. You've got to maybe you want to diagnose something properly and treat it properly you maybe need a mobile laboratory, microscope, microscopes, uh, rotators, centrifuges, and other diagnostic equipment. You've got your cold chain to worry about for a lot of, um, a lot of your uh, medicines and vaccines. So maintaining that cold chain and all these other things that are fragile um, and uh, in, a, in a rugged, uh, you know, rugged environment can be um, really difficult. I will pose one question for you um, that you can think about. One time when I was, I believe it was Darfur, we would have um, 
a lot of clinics that we only visited during the day would come back. It was, it was quite unsafe. To get out there, it was two hours. Uh, it would be a typical travel time. And then two hours back, of course. And you had to be back by sunset for security reasons. What would you do? What do you think the rule book said or the guidelines? Because you, you can always make a call locally um, or you can radio back for kind of more guidance. You arrive at the clinic. You've been driving for two hours. You get there. There's a long line of 100 people waiting to see you. And, but there's also somebody who's laying down, a man definitely in acute pain, who's in distress and um, really need, perhaps has more urgent condition. Do you, A, take that patient back for a meet depth back to um, drive back with that patient to get them to the hospital? Or do you see those 100 patients? Because you can't do both. Think about what, what the guidelines might say in that situation. And um, uh, I'll bring it up at the end. Don't let me forget. OK, hospital support. Um, this is uh, from Syria. There's a lot of places where we are um, basically uh, using an existing health structure that's been partially damaged, destroyed, or abandoned. Um, and we will try to work with the, the Ministry of Health if it's still functioning, um, or we'll just assume um, basically control of it if it's been completely abandoned and there's, there's, uh, there's no one there anymore. Um, so uh, a lot of times it's kind of a hybrid situation where MSF will provide certain services and the local hospital will provide others. Perhaps um, MSF will do the surgical ward, uh, but not the primary care and, and inpatient type of thing. So uh, there's different ways depending on uh, what the local resources are and what the local needs are. So uh, I, I think it also depends, of course, it, it goes without saying that it, you know, the level of services we're going to provide will depend on if electricity is steady or um, water is, is a factor. So. Um, there's a lot of other baseline considerations on, on what might uh, dictate what services you feel comfortable offering in safety. That said, we do want to push the envelope because it's always going to be hard and you don't want to say no to a patient. Surgery. Um, I think MSF sends a lot of uh, surgeons out. Uh, U.S. sends a lot of surgeons out. Um, we have a lot of folks who are very skilled in, in surgery and anesthesiology. So often what we'll do is we'll just add capacity, general, general capacity to existing hospitals that can't keep up with the need. Um, or we will sometimes develop new hospitals with the Ministry of Health um, and try to treat people um, injured in conflict or deliver babies by C-section. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, of different ways this can look. When I worked in Sri Lanka, um, it was general surgery um, and uh, a few other services, but, but I'll talk about it at the end. This one is Haiti. Actually, most of the surgeons there are Haitian. Um, so there are some expats or, um, excuse me, some, some um, international staff that go there. Um, and there's a lot of general uh, injuries that go on. Uh, you have what you'd expect in a, in a city the size of Port-au-Prince. So you have uh, a lot of motor vehicle accidents, a lot of bullet wounds, and then you'll have a flare up in violence, and then you'll have a, um, a lot of trauma, medical trauma to deal with. And um, at a certain moment, we had a, a burn unit. And this was not related to the violence. These were just household burns. Um, you had a lot of open fires uh, for, for various, uh, various household needs. And you would get a lot of injuries. And as you know, treated early um, or, or treated well, burns uh, can have a much different prognosis for the patient. Lots of orthopedic. I think this, this person is probably getting an external fixator. I can't tell. Um, but a lot of orthopedic surgery as well. Vaccinations. So it's a ton of uh, a ton of what we do, and uh, there's really not much to say. I really like how the child here is looking right at the camera, kind of saying, "What are you doing?" But um, uh, this one is in uh, Mali, um, and this is actually a project in Mali for refugees from the Central African Republic who have fled to the area um, due to a conflict there. Kind of infectious diseases, but we're trying to use the most effective treatments everywhere we go, but there's still a big gap in kind of what's made available for things like HIV AIDS, as I spoke about malaria and tuberculosis and the rest of the world. There's also a big gap in the research and development for these diseases. Again, you get me on that tangent, I'll be talking for an hour. So there's a lot of issues with both the development of, of therapeutics for these diseases, 
um, because although they affect millions, they're not very profitable. Um, and there's also, once they're created, um, there's, there's a challenge getting them to the patients that need them. So um, there is a special unit called the Access Campaign um, within MSF that advocates for more effective and affordable medicines and diagnostics. All right, so here we are in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, the caption I'm seeing on the photo is that it's a home visit to persuade this uh, patient to continue treatment. Um, it, so this, I, I think when I was first starting in public health, amazed me. I never realized that adherence would be such an issue, um, but it's universal, right? It's in the US, it's everywhere. Here you are, maybe take six months of your pills for tuberculosis and you'll be cured. But as you know, right, a month into a lot of these, uh, a lot of uh, treatments, I feel fine. But I know the drugs make me feel ill. Um, I, ran out of, I ran out of pills, perhaps, because they got lost or taken from me, and I don't have transport to the hospital. There is a whole slew of reasons that, that uh, treatment is difficult. And sometimes the case management needs of, of this connection, like you're seeing here, and, and working with the patient to meet them with their challenges and support them, is, is more intensive than the actual clinical uh, inputs that are needed. Um, nutritional support. So here's our innovation in nutrition. So, little bag, what I mean, what's the big deal here, right? So when I first started with MSF, what would happen? You get a corn soya blend, you would mix it in this big tub, it would be stirred up and it would be um, put out in different pots and pans and it would be kind of this food line that would happen. Um, which is fine, right? But it wasn't very efficient. I think one of the biggest problems is, is if someone came in with a very malnourished child, we did not want to release them for about two weeks. And so a mom says, well, hang on, I, I, I've got three other kids at home. I cannot stay here for two weeks for this one child to get back up to a safe weight, according to your metrics. And um, in fact, that's why I'm coming here so late is I did everything I could to avoid coming in. I, I, I have so many things to do at home that are also life and death. And so this would be a real tough situation to come from. And then what would happen sometimes is just as the mom and the child would leave, then the father would come in with another child who had also suffered in her absence and would be on this kind of um, really kind of difficult cycle. So staying inpatient for uh, malnutrition was necessary, but really, um, really had some severe practic practical drawbacks. So fast forward to this little thing, um, ready to use therapeutic food. So what this is, it is um, a nutrient-rich paste, primarily of uh, milk and peanut butter with some vitamins and minerals. It's not too different from some of the baby products in use in the US. Here's the key. They do not need water for preparation. So there's no risk of contamination with waterborne disease. Because of its packaging, it, can be, it does not spoil, does not need to be stored in any special way. Um, and even you can eat right out of the packaging. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but you don't need the bowls and the spoons and all this. You just snip a little corner off and you squeeze the paste um, into the child's mouth. So let's look at what that same visit looks like now with the mom. Okay, I've got one child inpatient time of two weeks before you can go home and all the problems, all the dominoes that knocks over it, that's gone. Here's, here's the plumpy nut, it's called. Um, here's 10 packs come back in two weeks so we can see how the child's doing and, um, and we'll go from there. And that was immeasurably better as far as adherence and success rates. So this little, this little way of, of um, packaging nutrition um, has had a huge impact on the success of nutritional programs. I'm doing that. Okay, actually, I need to speed up a little bit here. All right, diphtheria, this is um, um, a child getting antitoxin um, in Bangladesh or diphtheria outbreak. I will say that, boy, I, nowhere did I work where vaccination cards ever a problem. Every parent um, had their, their child's vaccination history. That card was, if you left the house with five things only, that was one of them. And a lot of these places, because these vaccine preventable diseases are still very proximate. I think here in the US, a lot of people are not familiar with a measles or a diphtheria um, outbreak or, or what it can do to someone. Um, a lot of these countries, these are viewed as very proximate threats. So vaccination is, um, the math is very clear, I think, and, and vaccine support is very high. Maternal health. So here's a row of, of new mamas getting, um, this is an obstetric program, 
So the, the main things that we want to do with our obstetrics is to avoid the three delays, they're called, that can threaten the lives of mother and the child. So this is the delay in deciding to seek care, the delay in reaching a health facility, and the delay in receiving appropriate treatment at the facility. There can be different complications in all three of those of, of, of why you're going to seek care late or not seek it at all, um, of why you can't reach the health facility, um, and why you may not get appropriate treatment once you get there. So um, there's a lot of prenatal care that we try to support um, and then um, make sure we have a uh, child uh, a safe, safe labor and delivery. So here um, standing is, this is a midwife from um, the US and um, she's uh, receiving, this is the maternity ward there. Okay, clean water and sanitation. I love this stuff. I'm a public health guy, right? So as we go up the, the chain of causation here, public health is a big thing. This would be your least efficient way you wanna do it, right? This is nice, it's the truck, maybe it's the nicest photo, but when you're trucking water in, thing, you're, you're against the ropes, right? It's, the, it's generally, um, you want a well water, you want another natural source. Trucking water in means it has to be filled up from somewhere else and, and brought in at great cost and uh, the roads have to be clear. So generally trucking is a temporary bridging solution until you've got some bigger tanks on board and some more things so you can reach certain thresholds of gallons per person that we need for drinking and washing uh, safely. These water supplies also have to be sometimes chlorinated. There's other ways that even when you bring them there in these tanks, um, you need to set them so they're not, uh, I don't want to say temper, you can be tempered with, but in effect is what you're, what you're trying to prevent is if the line is too long, it's gonna be tempting, right, to dip in a bucket into the top. And something like that can actually contaminate your tank, and now you're the source of an outbreak if your water source has not been maintained clean. So you wanna find a way that your water source is safe, but you're dispersing it in a way that you don't have a one hour wait in the hot sun from, by the people who need it. So this can sometimes look in this kind of branching set of, um, of water, water spigots that really just are pressure you touch them and it, it'll fill up your jerry can and that way it is both um, a short weight and clean water. As you can tell, something else uh, um, I, I tend to talk too much about, but Watt sand is a great subject. Search and rescue, I kind of spoke about this earlier. This is um, one of the overcrowded boats in the Mediterranean um, about um, intervening and making sure that, that migrations happen with safety and dignity to the extent possible and pushing against policies that might criminalize it or otherwise uh, make that journey more dangerous um, than it needs to be. Health promotion, there's a lot of prevention where possible. Um, so health promoters are a big part of education and prevention, um, getting people to seek care, letting them know what MSF is doing and why. Um, so this is talks in person, sharing messages in the media, using stories and songs. It really is context specific, depending where you are, um, how that message will be delivered, and of course, what the messaging is. Um, this one is um, during six months, uh, 110 MSF staff, including comedians they used apparently, uh, and 35 from uh, our colleagues at the Haitian Ministry of Health, um, would have organized meetings in some of the some of the neighborhoods to. Uh, inform the community about how to avoid falling ill with cholera. Now, if you'll know, cholera actually was, did not exist in Haiti before the earthquake. So there was not a lot of familiarity with it. And so we wanted to give a lot of education on what it was, how to recognize the signs and symptoms, because if you came in late, that would be the, the highest uh, risk of death from dehydration um, and, um, and, and make sure they knew what they were dealing with. So if you can tell me at the end, another one we'll put to the end, why did, why did color not exist before the earthquake, but did exist after the earthquake in Haiti? That will be another one we can table to the end. Hits and guidelines. Okay, and this, like nutrition, innovative as heck, and you don't even know, right? You think you're just looking at a box, but this containerized box and this whole method of, of making modular kits to respond to emergencies, again, huge efficiency gains um, for our clinicians on the ground. So. This is probably a basic medical kit, um, a small dis dispensary kit for a thousand. This is enough in theory with this set of, of blue trunks to provide um, primary health care for a thousand people for three months. 
right? So everything is packaged in there. You don't get this one box of bandages, one box of pill one and, and one box of this. All of that has been calculated to the best extent possible based on our experience and modulized. So you just order primary health care two months. I think I need three of those. We'll be in three village. Bang. It's really cool. Um, there are also other specialized kits. We have a surgery kit. So for trauma, so you can drop in and um, do X amount of operations uh, for a certain amount of time. Um, and uh, there is a cholera kit for responding to a cholera epidemic. Um, so I have to give a lot of credit to logistics and administration on creating these things along with the clinical guidelines that you see that are in many languages. You see those on the right. So a lot of information given and you can really hit the ground running with this. Um, if you were to see the possible list of orders that people used to have to go through to order all these things individually um, versus just saying, I need a surgical kit, two primary healthcare kits, and maybe we'll have cholera, why not have a cholera kit and put it in the warehouse? Done. Cholera kit is by far the biggest um, module. If you can tell me why, another one for the end, another bonus question, a cholera kit um, for 625 people weighs three tons and generally has to go in a cargo plane. Why would cholera be such a beast of a module compared to the others? Okay, logistics. So, I love this stuff, right? Here's the warehouse. This is in Bordeaux, France. Um, this is what uh, makes response quick. So think about it, right? Something happens. Our team is probably already there on the ground in one form or another. Logistics, here's the warehouse, pre-modularized supplies. They have a huge airport in Bordeaux. Everything is really, it's about getting the people and supplies there very quickly. So if we are working well with the Ministry of Health and it's not something that the, ministry, that the government wants to block people from getting into, the response time can be really quick. And bearing witness, this is a big part of what we do. I'm going to have to end early. I, I'm just talking way too long. So I'm going to blitz through the slides to, our, uh, um, to, uh, to the end so I can get to some questions here. Um, so this is a big part of what we do is saying what we're seeing. Um, we've seen this amount of trauma or wounds or exclusion. Um, it's difficult because saying those things can also get you kicked out of the country or it can make your international staff leave, but your staff who are hired locally can still be very much in danger. So on drug access, we don't have these issues, but on a lot of the other witnessing things, um, it's a really delicate balance, but it is something we feel that we really is part of our mission uh, when we can do it. And we, we want to, in fact, probably do more than, than we're um, allowed to do safely. This is where we're very different from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Red Cross um, does not, speak out. That's kind of one of their, um, one of their uh, MOs. That is not at all to criticize the ICRC. I think it's a really good way of working. And a lot of places will be working side by side with them. And because of the way they work, they can go places we won't. And because of the way we work, we can do things that, that they won't do. So I, I think it's really um, a complementary approach uh, on the two ways. I'm probably going to zip through um, I can, I can talk about recruitment stuff. So those are the slides that I think maybe people wanna see, but I'll zip through these real quick for a few minutes. So the obvious ones, right? Some medical, um, medical applications. We also have some, uh, a lot of um, paramedical. Yeah, there's the epidemiologist. That's the best they can do, right? Put them in scrubs at a computer for epidemiologists. It's not a very, uh, not a very uh, photogenic job. And uh, like I said, it used to just be clipboards. Um, mental health specialists and midwives OBGYNs. Um, a lot of logistics, you've got cars, you've got water tanks, you've got all these things that um, a, a lot of people to uh, make this all happen. Finance and human resource. I would be on projects. If I had a good finance and human resource person, I can concentrate on the program. If not, um, I was really dealing with internal issues half of my time and, and dealing with them. Um, Various, everything from nursing schedules to, to, to everything else that needs attention. Um, oops. Well, I want to say basically that most of our staff, by far, uh, the people who are doing the most work and taking the biggest risks are from the country themselves. So um, here are some locally hired staff. Uh, this one is in Jordan. This is a training session with uh, a surgeon. And here, as you can see, the breakout. Um, locally hired staff is by far um, the biggest part of what we do. 
And so we really try to represent that in our photos and all that. So it doesn't, people don't think that's just, we parachute in some people from the US or Europe and, and think we've solved everything. So um, it, it really is a, a group effort. Um, I was gonna talk about surgery, uh, some surgical programs in Sri Lanka that I was on, but I think in the interest of time, we will go ahead and stop the share now and then we can go um, to questions and answers or um, we can go through the, the uh, if I can remember the three of them are bonus questions that we, uh, we, uh, that I posed during the, uh, during the uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so you get out there. There's a ton of people waiting for you. You've got a hard decision to make. The general guideline is, think of your answer mentally, I'm not gonna take a poll. Um, you try to stabilize that patient, but you stay there and you see the line. If you start going back every time, um, you're never gonna see those patients, you might as well cancel it. There's always gonna be something and um, that clinic will then be viewed as unreliable because you will have to keep canceling it. Ideally, you would have maybe another vehicle to maybe take that person back and you could do both, right? But as I said before, these vehicles can't travel alone. So you, these security protocols uh, have huge effects on, on the reach of your program. So ideally you'd have so many vehicles you could take that person back, but you probably don't. So you're gonna stay and you're gonna see the line. Collar in Haiti. So um, uh, being on an island, Haiti had the fortune of never having uh, a cholera case. Um, and unfortunately, during the um, earthquake response, since it's a fecal oral transmission, um, some international staff, I believe the United Nations peacekeeping unit, um, the most likely source is they had uh, sewage that went into a stream. That stream was then used by drinking water downstream um, and that introduced um, cholera into the population. So you had a brand new disease introduced by, um, unfortunately, by people who came to help. And um, the last one, why is a cholera kit so heavy? So cholera, you, cholera will kill people through dehydration. You will start with diarrheal disease and then you will start vomiting and to the point your body cannot take liquids in anymore. And you die, you die of dehydration, sometimes within hours. And there's not so much uh, um, a cure for it as much as you treat the symptoms, right? So you manage the symptoms and that is through intravenous fluids. So what the main bulk of a cholera response kit is bags and bags of IV fluid. And that is huge and, and heavy. So that is why a cholera module is, um, is, uh, is the way it is. Six is, is three tons. Hi, my name is Jill Lewis. I'm a rising sophomore from Northeast Ohio. Thank you for the amazing presentation. And I just wanted to ask earlier, you mentioned there were a lot of problems with people adhering to your programs. It's something we've heard from a lot of other presenters, and I was wondering why that's such a problem. Well, it's not unique to international settings either. Um, I think we, we see it here. Um, there's a lot of different problems. I think if I look at, um, if I talk about Sri Lanka. So um, let's take the adherence. There was two weeks of chloroquine for your malaria. Chloroquine has instant side effects, where malaria, generally, um, if you've taken it, once the headache goes away, people say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to stop taking this. I know it's bad for me because there were um, uh, there was a lot of people who could have got if you took all of your pills at once. People know that often that would be a fatal overdose. So that is one way that it's a difficult sort of people don't perceive that they're feeling as sick as the medicines side effects are worth it. Some of it is transport. Um, people cannot get to the clinic, if, especially tuberculosis. It's very challenging. There's not only a lot of side effects, but there is um, it. It takes a long daily, what we call directly observed therapy. There have been some neat ways of case management that have been innovative now that you see smartphones almost everywhere. So you'll get people on a data plan or something and you'll do what's called DOT, directly observed therapy. And there are some ways that I will look at my phone, I'll take my pill, I'll show it to the doctor. Wait, look, I took my pill today. And the doctor will say, you know what? Don't come in. I saw that you did it. I saw that you didn't take care. So it's not so much a control of the patient as it is support. Someone's coaching you. Someone cares that you took it that day. Someone's checking in with you. So we're trying to find ways to meet the patients where they are. This is not about, you know, it's not about scolding them. It's not like they don't want to get better. So um, and we see that here a lot with different um, blood pressure and diabetes medications too. There's challenges in just taking your daily dose. Thank you for your presentation. Um... 
Um, I live in Korea and I'm a rising senior. And my question is also about the adherence, like, and, and specifically, I was wondering how MSF like addresses like misinformation, which like can like block like adherence to like treatments, like, for example, for COVID, the vaccines, like people, some people, like people aren't getting the vaccines because of inf misinformation. And also, like, I remember you mentioned, um, Haiti earlier as an example of like how like you have to like educate people on cholera so how um maybe places that aren't as easily accessible through social media like and those kinds of things how how you can like share information and communicate like why it's important to get these kinds of treatments and how to get them it has been a challenge i can't say that we've solved everything i can say that it's usually disease specific um, and there is also a layer of social media, as you say. We used, we used to not have many people in communications who did anything but maybe overall press releases or media. Now we have to watch Twitter and all these things all the time because not only health, but like MSF did this, that, or the other. If a rumor gets out that's a, about your project, that can affect your team's safety, right? So we have to be out there all the time working on not only medical inf misinformation, but political misinformation. Um, I think generally we would try to do um, education that is tailored to the context and tailored to the disease. It doesn't always work. If I take an extreme example, Ebola has been very difficult, right? Um, in the old days, what would happen is, right? People would show up basically in these big spacesuits to take the person who was sick away, right? These big infection control suits that you've seen, the big, all the, the white and the face mask and everything. And they saw we've got to take this person away. 50% chance they live, 50% they, you don't see them again, right? They die and then you can't even have a proper burial. So after a while, people are saying, I, I don't wanna do that. So this is not unique to MSF, but the adherence became very difficult. What really changed things was in um, a couple wards in Ebola, they lowered, they had these barriers that were these canvas barriers around the hospital that were about eight feet high. What they did, they lowered them to about four feet. That kept people away and out of the hospital, but they could see what's going on inside, right? So that helped stop a lot of the rumors. They also were able to set up a Wi-Fi. Here we go, in, in, even in the Ebola uh, setting, um, and they would have on the Ebola side an iPad, and people could talk to the relatives outside and say, "This is what's happening, and they're treating me, and all this sort of thing." And a third thing they did actually is when someone would would die from Ebola, they would have a viewing room, and so what would happen? You'd have a, a big bed there. And again, you couldn't get closer than a certain amount because we're not touching, but an, attend an MSF attendant would be able to lay out flowers and all this, and they would be able to say goodbye and take photos. And that provided, I think, the closure that everyone needed. So that's an extreme example, um, but we haven't, we haven't cracked the misinformation problem by any means. It's, it's still real tough. Students, thank you so much for the questions. And um, Greg, thank you so much for taking the time to speak at our conference. Uh, there are many, many thank you messages for you in the uh, chat. We appreciate all you do. Uh, so much respect for you and everyone at uh, MSF. Uh, we wish you the very best.